bet you are. I know that you've got a lot going on over there. Trenton, thank you for joining. Thank you for the nice comment. We're working on our videos. We're trying to make them as, as good as we possibly can. We want to improve the content. We want to improve the quality. Hopefully we're getting there. I took a look at a couple of old videos of uh, the last few days and boy, you know, from a lighting standpoint, from an audio standpoint, and hopefully the audio is doing okay right now. But from a year ago, year and a half ago, it's certainly, I think, a little bit of an improvement. So hopefully we keep going there. And I'm gonna throw on my glasses. I feel like an old man here, but uh, it's just that much easier to read some of these questions. Is it better to keep baby crusted geckos a little bit more humid so they can shed better? Um, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. We're going to get into the questions and answers in just a minute, but thanks for asking that here. I'm going to answer that right now. The best way to do it is to have it moist, and I mentioned this in the video from last week, uh, the breeding facility tour video. It's better to moisten the enclosure, to uh, mist the enclosure, uh, get it really nice and, and not wet, but uh, have mist on the sides of the enclosure. For babies, I put paper towel in the corner just to make sure that there's some kind of a, I'm going to say it, moist area somewhere in the enclosure. But it's also important for that whole enclosure, other than the paper towel, to absolutely dry out in between mistings. You want it moist so that they can absorb, they can hydrate. You want it to dry out so that they can shed better. If it's constantly moist in an enclosure for crusty geckos, that's going to cause some problems. Looks like it's 5 o'clock. Let's get this show on the road. So we have Northern Exotic Crystals, Barb, Aaron, Aaron, thank you very much for joining us. I know we talked a little bit earlier on Instagram. It's always hard knowing the names between the IDs between Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. And thanks for sharing. Thanks for joining us. Okay, I'm just kind of catching up on my on the questions here. What time zone are you in, Wally? I'm Central Time. Uh, we're in Wisconsin. Uh, Crystal, I think that you're Central Time too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Kansas City, if I remember right. Um, Creative Corellifus from Instagram, absolutely. Uh, 5 p.m. here. Craig M., thank you for joining us. I'm going to go right over to, thank you everyone for joining us. The purpose of this live stream is to answer the questions that everybody asked from our last week's video on uh, our facility tour. I started with a crusted gecko setup. It's 10 tanks, 20 highs, 20 extra highs. We keep our breeding crusted geckos. I made a very, very clear comment, and I'll reference that a couple of times in this video. It's a breeding facility. The purpose is for breeding. It's not for displaying. I have display tanks, but that rack is specifically to breed crusted geckos. Not to say that we don't enjoy them. We handle them. We manage them from those tanks, but those tanks are set up to breed, to, to get eggs from, and that's the, the absolute major part of the purpose of those tanks. So we have some questions from that video, and I'm going to share those right now. If you have questions during this chat, I'm going to try to keep up with this, but um, I might fall a little bit behind. So don't uh, be afraid. If I haven't asked, answered a question, ask it again. Thank you, Curtis M., for joining us. Uh, Benjamin Exotics, thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, your content on gre uh, geckos, isopods, and millipedes is some of the best currently on YouTube. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm trying. I, I started this channel about a year and a half ago. I'd had an older channel and I had some content on there, but a year and a half ago I found that there just really wasn't specific videos, specific information on the internet about some very rare geckos. And I wanted to, other than here's a gecko that I bought at a reptile show, I'm going to feed it some crickets and watch it eat crickets. And I just felt like there was a need for more information like that. And if I, as I get more animals and uh, more care behind those animals and start getting some breeding activity, I'm going to start sharing more videos on those as well. Hey, Lord, thank you very much for joining. I've got a, uh, your question, so that will probably pretty much take up the whole next hour with your question, but let me jump over some questions here. Bear with me for just a second here as I set up our questions.
This will just take a second, folks. Hopefully this works. I'm going to see if I can share the screen here with some of the questions. TH, the pod hunter, thank you very much for joining. Dane, thank you very much for joining. Here we go. And let me see if I can share this and we'll get started here. Okay, hopefully everybody can read that. It looks a little bit small, but uh, this is DEA Exotics. And again, based on last week's uh, video on crested gecko setups, they're asking what insects do you feel are the best for crested geckos? And I would say, uh, I'll go in order here. My least favorite probably, well, there's a lot of different insects that you can feed your crested geckos. I'm going to start from the, the least preferred of probably four or five here. Uh, silkworms, I've tried silkworms. I don't feel like the crusted geckos are eating the silkworms like I had hoped that they would. I'll keep working with silkworms to try to get their, their feeding uh, response better there. Uh, next up, uh, probably, probably dubias. Um, even though the dubias are running around the mealworm cups that I offer them in, they don't really seem to have much of a uh, feeding response off of the dubias. Probably the same with um, mealworms. Absolutely, positively on the top of the uh, feeding response uh, would be crickets for crusted geckos. Absolutely, bare none. I think that crusted geckos absolutely pound crickets. It's very, very important, especially in the, the winter time, coming out of that winter, uh, warming up to springtime, we dust and feed crickets. I usually feed crickets or some kind of a live food once a week, but coming out of that cool down period and into breeding season, we're just feeding crickets all the time. We're feeding them at least twice a week, sometimes three times a week. Uh, Hannah Hayes, thank you very much for joining us. And if I miss you, I'm very sorry for... We're missing a name here, Benjamin Exotics. I think I called you out here. Thanks for joining us. Let's jump over to another question here. Let's see if we can read that. I hope everybody can read this. Maybe not. Maybe it's too small. Let's see if that's any better. Okay, Barb. Great setup at uh, Wally and Nanette. Can a crusty gecko be housed in a 10-gallon aquarium standing on the end? Standing on the end is, is very, very important, and I like that, you know, we're giving them crusty geckos more vertical than horizontal, but I think a talon for me, a 12 by 12 by 18 exoterra, the same thing, is just a little bit too small. A major breeder just put out a video and said that 12 by 12 by 18s, 10 gallon-ish size is okay for crusty geckos. For me, in my opinion, that's too small. You really, really should go with the next size up in those enclosures. Again, 20 high is just perfect for one animal or even a pair because there's enough space for them to separate. That's in my opinion. Thanks, Barb, for that question. Let's hit the next question here. Okay, this is from RN. Okay, for cooling down, do you reduce photo periods as well? How cool do you go? How many eggs are on average? Let me just stop right there and uh, follow up on that. For cooling down, do you reduce photo period as well? How cool do you go? I'm going to see if I can share another photo here, maybe. I'm going to stop my screen. I'm going to grab this other photo. And bear with me. I hope this works. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So the question is, do we change our photo period? And absolutely we do. If you can see these timers, the one on the left, if I'm remembering correctly, the one on the left controls the crusted gecko area. The one on the right controls our leopard gecko area. And we'll see that in future uh, breeding uh, facility tours, but 
This controls the lighting, and I don't, you certainly can't see this, but I run a period of about, I think, uh, 14 hours right now on. And as we uh, get into the fall, around Thanksgiving or so, I'll bump both of those down about an hour. So two hours on either side, then another two hours, and then another two hours. So that my daytime period from like the end of November through probably the end of March, April-ish, is really short compared to our, our spring, summer, fall hours. So I really try to minimize that um, photo period during the winter, absolutely. Uh, your other question was, um, do you reduce photo period? How cool do you go? Our basement gets down to around 68, 69, 66 at the lowest. How many eggs on average do you get per female per year? Everything's in a spreadsheet. I, I should probably know this, but I would think that we'd probably get 12 to 16 eggs per female-ish, somewhere around there. Do you give females a year off after two to three years? I absolutely don't. Um, I don't think they get a year off in the wild. I think it's very important to cool them down in the winter so they can build up body fat and be ready for the next year. Unless I see a problem with one of my females, and I go through a very rigid uh, inspection in the springtime, unless I see a problem with one of my females, I breed it because I think that's what happens in the wild. Does that shorten their lifespan? Um, I don't think so. One of our oldest females now is Lucy. She's still producing and she's easily 14 years old, 15 years old. So, um, I think you have to kind of, again, follow nature and determine what nature does in a lot of these cases. I'm going to read a question off of our list here. Uh, what lines of, uh, this is from Dane, what lines of gargoyles, geckos do you breed? What lines? That's a pretty long uh, question. You can go to our website and actually go to our collections page, and you can see the crusteds and the gargoyles that we breed, the lines that we breed. Um Real quick, uh, we breed Dalmatians, Reds, uh, Red Harleys, High Harleys, Mochas, uh, Pinstripes. I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple. Uh, there's a few others in there, too. Hope that helps. Um, isopod information, uh, this is from RN. The isopod information is top-notch. The gecko content is even better. Thank you very, very much. That uh, Points like this always mean a whole lot to me. It, reinforces that I'm doing some of the right things. So thank you very much. Uh, Jordan, hi Wally, hello stream. Thanks for joining us. Let's get back to the questions that were asked last week in the facility tour. And the next question is from Lindsay. Let me see if I can get that on screen. Hopefully this screen sharing thing is working for everybody. Okay, let me jump back over here, make it a little bit bigger so we can read it. And this is from Lindsay Wheeler. I'll see if I can read most of it. This the, probably would take up the rest of the hour. Hey, I have a question. So what are your thoughts, uh, uh, thoughts on breeding? If the breeding tank is also the regular home tank for the gecko in terms of substrate versus lay boxes. What I mean is, I understand exactly what you mean. So you have... We get out of here. You have a setup where you use that setup, Lindsay, both for breeding and for normal care. And that's great. In my video last week, I said that I don't put anything on the substrate because I don't want the animals laying their eggs, the females, laying their eggs in the substrate uh, because it just makes it that much harder to find those eggs. I want them to lay in the, the uh, lay box. And if you have it set up for Switching the animals around, if you have enough tanks to keep the males apart from the females, I think that was in your question, um, and you switch them around, but yet you have your tank set up with substrate. I just think that you might also incur a problem like that from a humidity standpoint. If you have a humidity problem where it's not um, humid enough, then you need to be misting a little bit more. I'm sure you're doing it the right way, but... Um, you know, we miss every other day, especially in the summertime when it's when it's a little bit more humid. Uh, in the wintertime, we're probably missing every day just to get that humidity built up. You don't want it humid all the time in those sub uh, in those setups. 
That's so important. You want it to dry out to allow the animals to shed better. Very, very, very important. Um, let's go to another question. Okay, this is from Belize Pets over on that England side. So, uh, wow, great setup. Uh, very organized. The only question I have is how are you supplying the lighting and heating for all those things? Seems like there would be, there wouldn't be enough outlets. There's enough outlets. When I did that electric setup, that was a pretty costly setup. Let me get out of this here. Um, that was a pretty costly setup for us uh, to set up the electric, but uh, my thought was, and this goes back again, probably about, probably about 17 years, and I knew that I was getting into this hobby, this business. So that was the one thing I really wanted to do right. So we put in those two boxes in the leopard room alone, I think I have four, eight outlets on the ceiling, and then I run uh, where I need it. I run extension cords for lighting or uh, uh, separate lights or something like that, or heat tape. You know, I'll run one line for a heat tape or for the uh, for the box for the heat tape. Um, over on the crusted side, I have one, two, three boxes with four each, so that's twelve outlets. Um, and again, uh, you can see the, the extension cords that I use in that room, but the extension cords are very, very important, and I check them all the time. The extension cords are for the lights. Uh, the heat tape goes specifically to the outlet box that we installed, and uh, I make sure that that's all safe. And I think we have another question coming up about, you know, the safety of the whole um, electrical system. So, down the wormhole... Thank you for joining us. Love your channel. Love your channel. Thank you for joining us. Basement Pets, uh, the screen sharing is working. Excellent. Excellent. Glad that's working. Thanks for the confirmation. Uh, do you have a generator for backup power if you lose power? You would have to ask that question. I do not have a generator. Um, so if I lost power, especially in the summertime, and I, I have one time in 20 years, or just about 20 years, I lost power for, I think it was six hours, and I was seriously considering running an electric cord across the street to our neighbor's house to keep the incubators going. We cover up the incubators with blankets, um, you know, for the animals, as long as it's not the dead of winter, um, it's really not that big of a deal for them to cool down, cool, excuse me, to cool down a few degrees. I really worried about the incubators and the eggs. But after that, those six hours without having heat to those incubators, the temperature stayed the same. Without having electric to those incubators, the heat, the temperature stayed the same in those incubators. So I'm not too worried about it. I'm very, very fortunate. Again, in the house that we've lived in here now for uh, 15, 17 years, I should know this number, but we've never had a an electric outage for more than uh, probably about a half hour knock on something here. Um, so I'm not too worried about it. I would worry if we had a, a storm and we lost power for a day or two or three days. That would concern me. But um, again, very fortunate we haven't had that issue. Let's check another question over from the video yesterday. And let me share that here. Okay. There we go. Let me get it bigger here so we can see it. Look at that. Okay. Lord, you have your question. Okay, you want a question? Here they come. Number one, how are you maintaining heating and cooling in the room? So we just talked about the lighting. Heating, I have controlled by FlexWatt for the most part. Let me get back over to the screen here. For the heating, am I going right? Am I going left? For the heating, um, for... Uh, the 10 gallons for 15s where I keep all of my African cichlids, cichlids, where I keep all of my African geckos, I have them all running uh, flex watt heat underneath the tank. So very, very low wattage. I think they're all four watts. But I have a piece of plywood, so that helps keep the, the heat in. And I um, get the temperatures up to the low 90s, mid 90s for those. For the leopards, I have a heater. 
For my bug room, I have a heater, a small ground heater, uh, as low as a wattage as I possibly can because I have those rooms fairly insulated. So of everything that I have in the room, I, I really feel like, you know, with LED lights and fluorescent lights, um, with a heat watt or flex watt tape, I really feel like I'm really pulling not a whole lot of electricity from those other than the two heaters. And, you know, in the summertime, it's certainly less of an issue because we're a little bit warmer down there until, you know, my wife turns on the air conditioner because it's so hot in the house. But um, I try to keep everything, you know, as low wattage as I possibly can downstairs other than those two heaters. Uh, Curtis M, um, hey Wally, can you show and tell us how you keep track and record your, or your record, your reptile records, or make a video on it? I would love to make a video on that. I'm a I think a lot of people know this already. I'm an Excel geek. I think we have a question on this later, and I'll, I'll pass it over if I can answer it right now, if people don't mind. I keep everything in Excel. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can keep um, information about your reptiles, uh, uh, hatch dates, uh, lay dates, uh, keep track of the animals themselves, keep track of the tanks. So in the video, you saw that I had the tanks labeled CR1, CR2, CR3. In each one of those tanks, on my spreadsheet, I have the animals. Are we still online? I hope we didn't lose everybody. Um, in the Excel spreadsheets, I have the tank number and the individual animals associated are in those tanks. When I have a lay, I pull those animals out, I put on the piece on a piece of tape the tank number because that's a specific set of animals and I put that on and the date and I put that on a box when they hatch out then I put the hatch date and I take that tape and I stick it to the enclosure that those babies are going to um, <clears throat> and I put a new number on that uh, new <clears throat> excuse me I put a new number on that animal so I can tr keep track of that animal like CR20 for the year Zero, 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 0001 like I would get up to 999 animals maybe and then every all of that information goes into my spreadsheet if I have a set of bad eggs if I have a bad egg I put that on tape or I take the whole tape and I'll put that on a piece of paper and then I'll record that piece of paper into my spreadsheet so I can track also hatch uh, success um, am I at 70 percent am I at 80 percent I can keep track of the number of eggs per tank. Um, unfortunately, you know, if I have two females in a crusty gecko tank, I'm tracking the two females. I'm not specifically tracking hatching activity per animal. So, um, yes, we have all of those records. So when I get my CR20001 or whatever it is, I load that into the spreadsheet. And as I get to a point where maybe I want to hold that animal back, I keep that number, but then I give it a new name, like um, Red Bell or whatever. And with that new name, then I uh, assign it to a tank, you know, if I'm going to breed it. And I track that information that way as well. But I can always go back to that CR20001, and I can track back lineage and all kinds of information like that. I hope that helped. Hey, Gary, thanks for joining us. Uh, let me jump over. Ah, uh, Gary McIntyre says it's breaking up here in Scotland. It's probably breaking up at my neighbor's house. I think I just saw that it, it was uh, lagging a little bit. Gary Orner, thanks for joining us. Wanted to make that clear. Um, Dane, do you mix some fruit juice or something uh, in to keep the variety food-wise, Rapashi Pangea? Um, <clears throat> I haven't used Rapashi in years and years and years since I had the big issue. I, and I probably won't go back to Rapashi. I use Pangea. I don't mix anything. I'll mix some honey in once in a while. But the Pangea mix is specifically blended to be a full uh, complementary to their dietary needs. Now, having said that, I also, and I've mentioned this before, I dust my crickets. I make sure that they have a good calcium and supplement, vitamins uh, supplement uh, uh, dusting at least once a week. So... I'm getting that into the animals as well. And as I mentioned, in the springtime, I'm feeding at least two, maybe three times a week. 
and they're just getting pounded with uh, with calcium. From a treat, and maybe this is what you mean, uh, Dane, from a treat standpoint, I really don't give them treats. You know, they're getting the Pangea diet, they're getting the, the insects, mealworms, dubias, and crickets, um, and silkworms, and that's pretty much, you know, what they're getting. Um, Dane says what issue, but I'm not sure what that means. I'm going to jump back over to our questions, and let's see if we can share the screen here bigger. So this is from Melon Popal. I know I should be able to say these numbers by now. So I recognize the names from YouTube, but I never, you know, in my mind, pronounce the names. So um, great supporter of our channel. Thank you very much for this question. I see you give the animals individual names, quite cr creative ones, I must say. Thank you very much. But do you also record uh, pedigrees of your lineage? Or maybe do you not really breed uh, consecutive generations at all? I do breed consecutive generations. I do track lineage. Perfect anti-segue. We just talked about that. So hopefully that answers your questions. If it doesn't answer your question, anybody that it, of all these questions that I'm answering, if it doesn't answer your question, please, please leave me a question in, on this video. Let's get to the next question here. Uh, okay, this is from Elaine. Sorry for the, the um, little mess here. Is the, oh, this is because, this is two questions, I think. In the misting uh, water RO or is the misting water RO or dechlorinated water? Where do you find such small muir containers? I'm going to catch that very first question and mention that. I'm going to go back over here. So the water that we use for misting uh, the crusted gecko containers, I mist directly from the faucet. So I have a garden hose hooked up to the faucet. I mist and I put it on mist. I don't put it on anything else. My feeling is that by the time it mists everything and by the time it gets on the sides of the glass, on the plants and everything, by the time the animals start uh, actually licking the, the water, chlorine has dissipated from the, the water. Now, when I water other geckos in a dish, I'll put the water in a bottle. Hopefully you can see that. In a bottle, a big bottle, like a uh, sprayer bottle or bigger, and I'll put that to the side, and I don't use that water for probably about a day or so. Coming from the aquarium hobby, um, I know that chlorine dissipates from, because it's a gas mixed with the water, it dissipates from the water fairly quickly, so it's really not an issue. So that's how we do that. I don't have an RO system. I don't um, treat the water. Uh, I, I'm a big... Uh, uh, fan of not treating water, uh, even if you keep aquarium tests uh, down the wormhole, I, I know that you probably treat your water with some things, maybe not, but um, I'm just not a fan of treating water. Let's see if you have another question here. Uh, I'm guessing this is come, coming from Theropod Hunter, Theropod Hunter, I'm guessing different gecko species have different difficulty levels of keeping. Absolutely. It's just like Oh my gosh, it's like anything else, really. Um, amphibians, uh, fish, uh, certain conditions. Uh, I know that some fish, as an example, Coriodorus, uh, the little catfish, um, actually have, you, what you have to do is drop the water levels and just dump in cold water, and that stimulates the spring uh, rains that they get in their country. And, you know, with that cooler water, it just automatically, you know, sets them off to breed. So geckos are the same way. You have to do some different things, uh, set up their enclosure, their habitat, um, different foods. Um, you just have to uh, do different things. You have to, some geckos, and, and Gary Orner, you can uh, attest to this, some geckos, like leopard geckos, some people cool down, they brumate during the winter to then stimulate them to breed, and brumating can have a lot of other benefits to it, but then bringing them up and heating them up in the springtime then stimulates breeding activity. Um, this is from Basement Pets. Have you ever kept bred any other reptiles, inverts? 
Uh, such as snakes? No. My wife doesn't allow me to keep snakes, and I've said this before, but if I ever brought a snake in, she's told me that if she finds a snake in the house, she leaves, and the MasterCard goes with her. So I think I just, I, I think I get the dog, if I remember right. I think I still get Gus Gus. So uh, let's see here. Who else? Mr. Grindler's Creatures, thank you very much for joining us. If you keep tarantulas, if you keep uh, spiders, make sure you go over to his um, YouTube site and watch his videos. Really super cool. Uh, down the wormhole, I use dechlorinators on a few things, uh, not all the containers. Uh, same down the wormhole, I want to use distilled just because of how hard our water is. Good point. So with aquarium fish, obviously you try to manage the pH and the water hardness and everything, so you might have to do some things. Uh, Mr. Grindle, ever kept tarantulas? I've never kept one. I probably won't. I held my first tarantula about five or six months ago. I have a, a I can't even describe, I'm, my, the hairs on my arm right now are, are standing on end, just like I watched an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Um, I'm deathly afraid of, of tarantulas. I'm deathly afraid of spiders. If I see the spider in front of me and I can follow that spider, it's fascinating to me. The animal is fascinating. Um, if, if I see a spider, if I'm downstairs, I see a spider, I turn to do something else and I come back and the spider's not there, it freaks me out. And I can't do anything in my mind until I find that spider and make sure I know exactly where that spider is. So I would love to keep tarantulas. I just, I can't. If that one, I, it, I know they're in tanks. I know they're safe. I, but if ever one got out, I would be worried that I wouldn't handle the spider correctly to get it back in the enclosure and I might harm the spider. A gecko, no fear, cup it, top, get it back in the container. But the tarantula, I don't know if I could do that safely. It, I would feel like I would be doing more harm to the, the uh, spider. Let me get back over to real quick these questions. Let me bring up the next one here, Basement Pet. Uh, this is really cool, and again, we're referring to the um, uh, breeding facility tour video that I did last week. Uh, hopefully you can see, let me bring that, sorry, let me bring that up again. Okay, there we go. Uh, breeding our basement pets, this video was really cool. I don't have any crusted geckos right now, but I do have some leopard geckos. Those geckos are beautiful. I would love to breed geckos at some point. I have a question, though. Do the geckos ever lay eggs in places other than their hides? Anybody that's keeping geckos knows that if a, and has been doing this for a while, knows that if a gecko lays an egg somewhere else in the enclosure, that egg is probably not going to make it, number one. Number two, it's probably bad, and it's probably bad for a reason. It's their first lay. It's their last lay of the season. Uh, they don't have the right calcium. They're stressed out. They're not healthy. So if I find a, an egg somewhere in the enclosure uh, other than the lay box, 99%, maybe not that high, uh, there's a good per high percentage that that egg is probably bad. Do I incubate it still? If I think that it might be okay, I still put it in the, in the medium and throw it in the incubator and try it out. Let's grab another question here. This is from Elaine. And let me get that up on the screen here. And Elena is asking in the midst, of, oh, we just talked about that, the RO system, sorry. Uh, and she also says, when are we going to see a display tour? You just saw a display tour. We just did the display tour. We just did the start. So that display tour that you're asking about, I started it with the crusted gecko stand, my first crusted gecko stand, breeding crusted gecko stand. That's one of four adult crusted gecko stands that I have. I have over 55 breeding groups of, of crustics. And what I wanted to do, I could have done a full tour. It would have been six hours if I wanted to do the detail that I really wanted to do with a tour like this. Uh, what I did instead was I'm going to take certain sections out and try to talk through the animals that are in each um, section or rack and give each um, section it's just to and make sure that uh, the people that are watching the videos get an understanding of why I have these set up like they are. Um, 
what's in the, each tank, just like the 10 uh, setups that we just saw last week, you got to see every single one other than a couple. One just wasn't showing, so I had to pull some old pictures. And one of the tanks, I pulled some of the decor out and the animal. If you keep trust the geckos, you know this site was freaking out and the tail was shaking. And I thought, it's going to drop its tail. So I put everything back calmly and I went to the next tank and I uh, forgoed, forgoed. Uh, I, I bypassed that one and not taking any pictures of that one. Maybe I can do some video on some of the animals in the uh, rack systems that I have in the future. And maybe that will be a little bit of an incentive to watch these individual setups rather than one huge tour. There's a guy, there's a fellow, a great person that does videos on his isopod setups where he feeds them. And he talks a little bit about their care, but those videos are about an hour and 10 minutes each one. And I love isopods. I love seeing his animals, but after about 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I just, I start snoozing. So I don't want, you know, these videos to be an hour long. I want them to be about 10 to 12 to 15 minutes each one. So we can get as much information about these animals as we possibly can get out there. Let's see if we have some questions from the chat. We have RN, Chris Gecko. She will lay in a, a cork tube, though. That's really odd. Is Catch me on a PM to Facebook or Instagram, and let's talk about that. Because if you have the hide box set up the right way, they absolutely positively should use that hide box. Uh, what issues did you have with Rapashi product? Rapashi changed, Dane, thank you for the question. I don't want to get too political with this answer, but Rapashi about um, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, changed their formula because they wanted to export. And export rules said that you couldn't export um, protein, uh, organic protein. So they had egg um, in their egg formulation in their uh, recipe, and they took the egg formulation out, didn't, Alan didn't tell anybody it really, you can go back to some posts, but I would say of 30 adult uh, breeders that I had, I probably lost a third, um, maybe more. And I know some breeders lost, lost half or even more of their breeding colonies. These are established breeders. I compared notes. I had a, a great network of people that I compared notes to. It just, it was frustrating and I and I felt guilty because I kept saying it can't be the the diet it can't be and then I would lose an animal it can't be it's got to be me I'm doing something wrong what am I doing wrong started comparing notes and everybody was that was feeding were Pashi had this problem there was before Pangea or actually it was just as Pangea was uh, gearing up and it, it was a big concern so I was selling her at the time I, I told the story before but I had over Twelve or fifteen hundred dollars worth of product that I just threw in the dumpster. I, I was done with it. I it, it was a huge problem. So I, I'm not going to dwell on it. But um, uh, let's see if we can catch another question here. Elaine, I have read the geckos needy. Forty get. I think you asked this question. Maybe I passed it. I, I apologize. Uh, geckos need a forty gallon tank. How do you get away with twenty? How do I get away with it? Ah, you make it sound like I'm sneaking around. Let me see if I can get away with this. It's actually, I hope you, this is all in fun. Um, it's, it's setting them up according to what their needs are. Um, is a 40 gallon better than a 20 gallon? Yes. Does it take up more space? Yes. Is a 20 gallon functional for a pair or sometimes even a trio of trusted geckos? You have to watch them. You have to know your animals. But I absolutely firmly believe the 20s are okay for a pair. Um, I don't think I'm getting away with anything. I think that I'm finding the right combination of, of space, utilizing space, with also making sure that the animals are as healthy and well taken care of as I possibly can get them. This has been working years and years and years. I know big breeders. I'm, I'm small potato compared to some, some other breeders that are breeding in 20s or even smaller enclosures. Um, 20 feels right for me, 20 high feels right for me, and it, it's and it's been working. As long as you're meeting the other criteria, and you have to get their other requirements down. You have to get the missing, you have to get the food. Uh, I think live foods has been a big, big plus for me over the years. So 
I think it works for me. And, you know, if it doesn't work for you, that's great. Um, but I think that you can look at that as an option. Let's see if we have any other questions. I'm going to go back to last week so that we're covering these. This is from Critters or More. Let me see if I can share the screen. So Critters and More have the question. I have the water question as well. If you use RO water, do you have an RO system? No. We talked about this a little bit. The water or do you add minerals? Okay, we talked about the RO, no RO. Let's jump over to the next question here. ZD Exotic says, at what age and weight can Crested Geckos breed? Let's get back to our screen here. At what age, what size? I generally um, don't breed females until they're in the mid to high 40s. I want to, and that's in the springtime. I want to make sure that they're healthy enough to start breeding. This is a bit of controversy, but I don't care about males. If I can see that it's a male, the male knows it's a male. In the wild, males that are mature will breed with females, period. Am I going to take a, an 80-gram female and breed it to a 28-gram male, 34-gram male? No, absolutely not. Am I going to take a 38-gram male and breed it to a 50-gram female? Absolutely. Will I watch that tank a little bit closer? Absolutely. So from a weight standpoint, if, a, if it's a male and it's compatible with the female from a size standpoint, age standpoint or so, yes, I'll breed the male. Females, um, high 40s-ish. What age? I don't know. That year and a half, about year and a half. Let's see if we can get another question in here. This is from Bob Cobb. And let me show the screen. So Bob Cobb is asking, I'm always paranoid about blowing out an electrical socket. How uh, could I calculate how much a socket and breaker can handle? I was curious because I've noticed that you have electric, UVB, et cetera, at, on the habitats. And I was curious if there was, if there was a way to use electricity providing UVB, plant LEDs, and basking lamps if necessary for a multiple, multitude of enclosures without using too much on the electrical or blowing out the circuits. So I don't really measure at all. I know about how much I can run downstairs because I've never had a problem that's probably not a good to look at it. But um, my two biggest concerns, again, is the heaters that I have in the bug room and in the leopard gecko room, and I watch those, I check the cords, I make sure that everything is going. I've never blown, you know, one of our breakers, so I'm very, uh, I feel comfortable with that. My wife, you know, plugs in the hair dryer up here and it blows a, a circuit. She plugs in the um, George Foreman uh, grill and it will blow, a, I'm exaggerating, but in the gecko room, you know, everything's, again, really, really low wattage. It's really not a problem other than I just watch those heaters. Okay, let's see if we have a question in the chat. Uh, Benjamin Exotics, thanks for the response. I had never heard of this problem with passion. I will definitely have to do some further researching on this subject. And I don't want to, again, you know, the purpose isn't to bash Rapashi. That That's not my purpose. Rapashi has done so much to this hobby. Um, moving it forward, I have two concerns with Rapashi, though. One is the change in food, and, and I'm sure that the foods are great right now. The other concern is that I wish Alan would take the animal that he works with, the, the vast number of um, Gecko City works with with this vast knowledge and do something to move the hobby forward as far as using test cells of these animals to prove things out, like like uh, sex, uh, temperature sex determination. Um, does does the temperature of hatching out the crusted geckos impact their crust size, uh, their weights, their health? Their um, so I know he does. Great testing on his food. I just wish he would move forward with that. But again, this isn't a this isn't a bash or bashy because I think he's done some great things in the hobby. So let's go ahead and move on. This is from Alan John. Hi, I'm from England. Why do you keep any strophurus? Oops, I just lost it. Um, 
Strophurus or Oyodora or any other Australian geckos. I keep, um, oh gosh, I keep Levis Levis, I keep Meli, um, I keep, um, gosh, I used to keep Strophurus, I keep Oyodora, the whole name classification has changed, so I don't know, you know, what that means to, to the hobby and what I keep, but I keep one, uh, Robustus, I think it is. Um, so not many. I'd like to get into more Strophorus, William's Eye, as an example, a great little gecko. Uh, let's see here. Brad Clark has a question while I am a former cheese from Kenosha. Kenosha, I grew up in Kenosha, um, just outside. I grew up uh, on Camp Lake, Silver Lake. So you probably, Brad, know that area quite well. What part of Cheese Line are you from? Camp Lake. Um, if you don't mind, love your videos, kids down the street is infatuated with isopods, turn, uh, turned him on to your channel. Thank you very much. If there's anything that you think that I could do from an educational standpoint with isopods more for kids, let me know. That's that's the, the intent of this channel is to educate as much as I possibly can. Uh, if I need to bring it down a level, you know, from a beginner standpoint, let me know. Always open to, to um suggestions or criticism or what the channel thank you lord you threw it all away and now you could have used it to feed your isopods what did i throw away oh the rapashi um i actually i said that i threw it in the can but i actually used it to feed the roaches and they all died i'm just just kidding i fed it to the roaches and they did fine so Andrew, DEA Exotics, thank you very much for joining the show. I appreciate it. Uh, sorry I'm late for the show. I'm late for every live show, so no worries whatsoever. Let's get to another question from last week's video on the facility tour. And let me grab that real quick. Okay, this is going to be, let me see if I can get back to the screen here. This is going to be from Samantha, and Samantha is saying, you've made most of your own stands, it seems like. Have you found a pattern or plan that you find yourself going back to when it comes time to add new racks? Where do you get the little square feed, feed dishes? I'll talk about the food dishes in just a minute, but I want to share with you real quick. Let me see if I can do this. Bear with me, folks, for just a moment because this is going to be really super interesting. Um, so I'm going to show the electrical outlets here, but the question is, what kind of pattern do I use for these stands? So this is the stand from the video from last week, this is the 10 crusted geckos, and you can see it's a basic two by two hooked together. There's hardly any weight on this stand whatsoever. Let's jump over to another stand. This is our 15 gallons, a little bit more weight on this. I have a couple more bracings on this stand, but you can see the bottom is braced, the top really isn't. I don't get much of a bow, a little tiny, tiny bit of a bow on the top, but this is our African, uh, uh, Gecko, I want to say cichlids so bad, African cichlids. It's our African gecko tanks, and uh, actually I have some Periodora in the bottom. Um, but this stand is basically the same kind of setup. Here's another stand. This is our gargoyle stand. We have 15 gargoyles on here. Huge tubs, absolutely huge tubs. These are, I want to say they're 70 quarts, 80 quarts maybe? Maybe they're 90. I'll have to check on that. I have a video on making this stand. This stand, the two stands, I should say, all the tanks, everything, I think, came in around 150 bucks for these 15 containers. So this is a basic design. We're going to get into a second phase of how I build these stands. Basic side legs with just shelving on top. This is one of my favorite uh, stands. This was our cave gecko stand. It worked great for the, the juveniles. Didn't obviously work for bigger uh, cave geckos. The stand worked really, really well. 
Here's another type of that stand, but I use uh, the plywood on the sides, plywood as shelving, and if I'm not mistaken, that's half-inch shelving to hold some of the weight of these uh, Periodora Picta and some of the sand in the enclosures. Here's my favorite rack of all time. This is a 21-unit, 19-quart crested gecko grow-out tank. So this takes them from about one and a half months or so to about five months or so. And you can see this is just a great stand. It's a simple, you know, four legs with shelving. That's all. I use this so I don't have the tops. I slide the the um, I slide the tubs in and out. It works great. Feed. I've got the holes in front of the tanks uh, to do the misting, so I can go down one, two, three, and I mist everything out. You know, every night, every other night. Um, this stand. Let me see if I can get back to the picture of the stand here. This stand probably cost me when I built it. I don't even know. Probably about thirty or forty bucks, and it's lasted years, fifteen years. Love that stand. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. I tried to build them as quick and easy as I possibly can to try to hold up that weight though. The one stand that I do have a little apprehension about because it's getting older is that 20 high stand for the crosses that I just did the video on. I'd like to redo that stand and make it a little bit uh, more sturdy. Let's see if we have a question in the, the chat. This is from Brad. Thanks for all you know that area well and use it to fish out there uh, constantly. Camp Lake, um, Center Lake. I lived on Center. I lived in Camp Lake, but Camp Lake is on Center Lake. I love fishing on, on Center Lake. Anyways, Curtis M., I need to build or buy a big rack system for my ball pythons. You know, it's hard to make that judgment between building and buying. It really is. It really is. So, you know, there's a lot of people that can help you with that decision. If you have questions about it, send them over and uh, let me know if I can help. Uh, Elaine says, hey, Crystal set up a tank in her classroom. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Um, with this experience, you know, hopefully we can share that amongst ourselves with other people. And that's exactly the way to do it. I would like to get into, you know, more isopod education in, in uh, classrooms. That's something that I'm looking at right now. Best cure for gargoyle geckos, same as crested geckos. Andrew, the only difference is I give them more. I give them more meat, you know. Um, whereas a, a crested gecko takes the quarter pounder with cheese. Uh, a gargoyle, I, I give them a whopper and and maybe two every night. Um, I feed gargoyles bigger prey items than crested geckos. Give them bigger food items. I've, I've watched gargoyles ignore, you know, um, juvenile gargoyles ignore a quarter inch cricket, but an inch cricket comes by and they just slam it. It's kind of, if anybody fishes, it's kind of that musky fishing mentality. I'm going to eat one time and I'm going to expend the energy to eat that one time, but I'm going to grab the biggest bait fish that I possibly can so I don't have to eat again for a lot of hours. Um, let's get back to our questions. And let me share the screen here. 